30 minutes after the hour. Thanks so much for being with us on this Tuesday morning. We are Miller and Moulton. This is Southwest Florida's Fox Sports Radio, streaming at millerandmoulton.com, broadcasting live on the Miller and Moulton Twitch.tv channel. Go to millerandmoulton.com, vote in our poll question, which today is which team do you view as the bigger contender between the two teams that are playing tonight, Buffalo and Tennessee, early voting, Buffalo viewed as the much bigger contender, even though the Titans went to the AFC Championship game a year ago. He's David Sampson, former president of the Marlins, part of the CBS Sports family. You can see him on CBS Sports HQ, and also you can get a daily dose of David Sampson with his Nothing Personal podcast, Nothing Personal, and follow David on Twitter at David, the letter P, Sampson, David P. Sampson. David, good morning. Hope you and your family are still doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Everything's good. You must be excited over there. You're in the championship series. And two games away from the World Series. And Mark said it in our first hour of the show that if you're a sports fan, never mind a baseball fan, the fact that the Braves got the early jump on the Dodgers has to excite you more. Your views on that series first. Well, we're definitely learning in this postseason that pitching and defense still wins rings. And that's something that was the case during my 18 years and stays the case even in this era of true outcomes where everyone's hitting a home run or striking out or walking. And the Braves, just they have a very deep lineup. And if they're young pitching, Freed and Anderson and Wright, if they continue to pitch the way they're pitching, they actually have a chance because their bullpen is better than the Dodgers' bullpen. So they really could win this series, even though I picked the Dodgers. I'm watching the game last night thinking to myself, wow, these guys are in that mode where they just feel like they're going to win every single game. And it's impossible to describe. It's impossible to try to concoct. But, David, you're right. I worked in hockey. You worked in baseball. David's worked with a bunch of teams. There are just certain moments when teams feel invincible, and it's rarefied air. And on top of that, David, with Freddie Freeman knocking one out of the park, something he's not done in the postseason, how much more confidence must that give the Braves? Well, I think they have that combination, that youthful exuberance. They're much looser than the Dodgers. I was watching the Dodgers, and the burden of expectation this late in the postseason becomes very heavy. And the Dodgers just look like they're playing not to lose, whereas the Braves are much looser. And they they feel like they're playing with house money, which is such an unfortunate expression, but really true. And they just seem like they're having more fun. Now, everyone says, well, when you're winning, it's more fun. And they were having more fun during the pregame warmups. They were having more fun during introductions. And then they got the early lead with the Freeman home run. And you just felt like, wow, that is what momentum is. And in sports, as you know, momentum is the most important thing. David, and I know you weren't with the team in 97, but, you know, I remember, you know, those Braves teams in the 90s, it just always seemed, and I don't know if it was how serious Bobby Cox was, but, you know, outside of the 91 team, it just seemed as if all the other Braves teams, that the weight of the world was on their shoulders. Even when they won it in 95, they were the favorites in 96 against the Yankees. They were the favorites in the LCS in 97 against the Marlins, you know, that they were the tight team. They were the serious team. You know, even when you guys faced the Cubs because of, you know, what the Cubs were trying to overcome, the weight of everything was on the Cubs. Did you feel that in 03 and with the Marlins people that you talked to, did they kind of feel what the Braves are feeling now that the Dodgers now are what the Braves were then? So it's a great, it's a great point. The way we thought about things in 03, we knew that we were, had been playing like the best team in baseball for months. We also knew that we were the underdogs for no particular reason because we thought we were the better team and we had the better record after like May 31st of anyone in baseball. But no one wanted us to win. No one cared about us winning. Everyone was interested that year in the Red Sox breaking their curse and winning the World Series, even though they lost to the Yankees in that Game 7 Aaron Boone home run in the LCS. Everyone wanted the Cubs to win because they hadn't won the whole Billy Goat curse. This was obviously pre-Bartman so because Bartman happened in game six of that series. So we just said, you know what? 
screw it. Let's just keep winning games. And then after the fact, they'll have to look at us and say, wow, we were a good team. We didn't care about legacy at the time of the games. And what I find with teams who are expected to win, they start thinking about their legacy before they've won any games. And you talk about the Braves in the 90s. They were a dynasty, except they got one ring. And it has caused a decades-long debate about who would you rather be, a Braves fan or a Marlins fan? Would you rather win the division every year and win one ring or never win the division, never make the playoffs except twice in 15 years, but win two rings? And my answer is I want the rings, but Braves fans say, no, we want the chance to win the rings, but not me. I'm a, I'm a consequentialist. I want to win. David, Braves fans say that because they don't have the rings. I lived in Atlanta and then ended up down in Florida. I lived in Atlanta when that started. I you know, grew up, uh, I liked the Pirates. I was there when Sid Bream stood across home, and there was such a, a an intense intensity to that city, and they were so into it. By the time that I left Atlanta, and I had friends still, I mean, you remember this, David, they weren't even selling out playoff games. They became bored with it. So don't let anybody in Atlanta tell you they'd rather have that run because they quit going to the playoff games. They were so bored with their team getting knocked out. It is a cop-out because they want the rings. Everybody wants the damn rings, David. That's why we do this, and that's where I think the Dodgers are in a spot now because, as you said, their bullpen is not as good as Atlanta's. And when you win and you have the, the payroll and the studs that they have, I have to imagine that every day that goes on, you're squeezing the bat a little tighter, and the pressure becomes greater and greater, doesn't it? There's no question. I don't know. I, I have to look. I, I was up till three in the morning trying to find any information on this. There must be a reason that Kenley Jansen was not in a tie game at home in the ninth inning. And our rule was very simple. Our closer came into the game in a safe situation or in a tie game at home in the ninth inning. Or if there had not been a safe situation in four days, we got the closer work which never worked out well because closers don't pitch well in non-safe situations, but we just had to get the closer work. Last night, they brought in Trinan, who then gave up the runs, and that was it, the home run to Riley. I'm just wondering what's going on with whether or not Dave Roberts trusts him because in the real world of baseball, when your closer doesn't come in, there's a reason, and it's not the manager's decision. The front office has to be involved. They have to have discussed that before the game that if you're in the tie game situation, we're not going with Jansen. That's not something that just comes up. Or he tried to warm up and then was hurt. Or they're trying to hide the fact that he's hurt. Something is going on there with the Dodgers that if they don't solve the Braves pitching, I think the Braves can win this series. So it's going to be exciting. And without off days, we're going to know soon enough. Well, uh, there's a couple of things there from what you brought up. First off, you know, David, sometimes we look at a series and say, if so-and-so can just be tied in the sixth or tied in the seventh, you know, they would take six or seven games of 2-2 in the seventh. The Braves certainly would love for this series to be every game 1-1 or 2-2 going to the seventh. They think they'll win this series. But do you think it goes back to, even though the Dodgers swept the Padres in the clincher, Jansen gave up two runs and had two runners on and had to be bailed out by Joe Kelly. And do you think the Dodgers have given up on Jansen as their closer? I think that that would be very difficult. You know, we had a situation, again, going back to our championship, where Uget Urbina, we acquired him at the deadline. He was the closer. And no one remembers this, but he was pretty ineffective during the playoffs. He blew a save in the World Series. He blew the save against the San Francisco Giants but ended up winning the game because Jeff Conine threw out JT Snow at the plate. And then he gets credit for the save, but it was a blown save. It was a hit, in my view, the way we looked at it. But bullpen arms are tired this time of year. But it's only been a 60-game season. But Jansen is just a little less effective. And it's it's a very interesting question. And uh, Pat Riley used to talk about this when John Starks, went two for 18 in the finals, game seven in 1994. He said, I dance with the people I brought to the dance when asked why he didn't replace Starks in that game. And that is the theory that many managers and front office people have, that we've been riding Jansen for all these years. We're not going to give up on him now. It would be very shocking to me if they had removed him from his closers role. 
We've got a big White Sox fan that listens all the time and just wants to know what they're going to do for a manager. Because I, first off, how much of a surprise was that that Renteria got blown out after taking them to the playoffs? And where do they go from here, David? So what surprised me only was the timing and then the explanation. So something obviously happened. They they bring the A's to three games. They make the playoffs. But it's very informative as to how executives are going to look at this season. And it's a 60-game season, which means the White Sox evaluated their own team and said, we brought in these veterans. We have a great young core. We signed Grandal to the big deal. We were over 500, 10 games over, had a great 60-game run, but we're not good enough in our minds to be there over 162 in a very tight AL Central. But why today versus after they got the day after they got eliminated? I'm not sure what they learned in the last five days. They blamed it on Renteria's bullpen usage and how he didn't manage well in game three. And that's a bunch of, of course, hockey, frankly, because you know that at going in what your bullpen usage is going to be. Managers don't have free reign to use their bullpen. The front office is totally involved in that. I think what happened is, is the GM... Uh, Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams, the president of baseball office, and Jerry Reinsdorf felt like they needed to get a, a championship pedigree manager in to take this final step. And they view themselves as on the precipice of turning back into a real World Series contender. So when I saw that Tony La Russa was the rumored manager, it just confirmed my suspicion they're looking for. They're not going to bring in a first timer, a young manager. They're going to bring in someone, a, a retread, someone who's won, because that's the stage of their of their redo that they think they're in. So, do I do I agree with that? Yeah, I do. Because when you're an owner, you say to yourself, "Okay, we got to the point we're at with this manager, with this young manager, even though Rentery is not young, but with this manager, now we're going to switch voices for the final lap." And that is a very common thing that owners think about. Boy, La Russa hasn't managed since uh, winning the World Series in 2011. Uh, game's changed a little bit. I don't know if Tony has, but the game has changed a little bit uh, since then. All right, let's talk Rays. I mean, this team would be different than the Rays team that made it to the World Series 12 years ago. You know, this is more... Uh, analytics driven and even more platoons and, you know, using more bullpen arms. I mean, you know, this team, this type of formula has had some success, but this type of formula has not gotten to the world series. You know, it's why the A's have never made it to the world series under Billy Bean. I mean, you know, are, are the Rays about to change baseball in which other people will now copy what they're doing if they can win two more games? Well, let's be clear from inside baseball. Um, teams are jealous of and trying to copy the Rays for the last 10 years. They were the number one organization that I looked to, and I couldn't duplicate what they do because I didn't have the discipline. The discipline to trade someone like Chris Archer a year too early versus a year too late, or a David Price a year too early versus a year too late, or to hire a Joe Madden as a manager who had not had a chance, or then a Kevin Cash. I just didn't have that ability. I was too scared is what happened. And what the Rays have shown to me is that if you put together a bullpen and you have power arms throwing 98 plus, you've got position players who complement each other, who have one thing in common, that they play great defense. You put all that together and you have a chance. And in, in, I look at this team, they're a really good team. And no one can name five of their players, <laughs> except if you're in baseball and you say, my God, where were you? This is what owners are doing all around baseball. Why don't we have Diego Castillo? Why didn't you trade for the Marlins to get Nick Anderson? How do you not have Peter Fairbanks in your bullpen? All of those things and questions are asked to executives around baseball, which is why executives around baseball can't stand the raise. Because it <laughs> makes them all <laughs> So, David, in all seriousness, though, if if you got a job tomorrow, are you saying that you would be gutsier, that because of the raise, you would be gutsier, you would trust your gut more, and you would just say, you know what, blanket? Uh, except for the end. It's not that, you know what, blanket, because it would all be done in a very 
systematic, analytic way. And I would not be seduced by names. I wouldn't be seduced by the emotion of keeping a player or, or, or deluding myself. What the Rays never do is they don't practice self-delusion. And that was my specialty. My specialty was, <laughs> hey, we're not winning right now, but we're going to turn it on because we've got these players. We're going to get good next month. All we have to do is win 15 games next month, and we're right there in it. And that constant state of delusion is what costs you. And the Rays don't allow themselves to do it. They don't fall in love with their own players ever. They don't care. And they, they believe in their evaluation, and they are willing to be proven wrong. When I have an evaluation, it takes me forever to believe I was wrong. But for them, when they're wrong, they move on. And that is a very tough, disciplined way to run a team, and it works. Look at what they're doing with the payroll they have. It's hard for a GM or a team president to go to an owner and say, listen, we got to spend $25 million on JT Realmuto, right? We've got to spend $30 million on Garrett Cole. Why is it that Hal Steinbrenner needs to listen to Brian Cashman in that way when in their own division they can look and see that those decisions are not necessary? David Sampson, former Back. president of the Marlins. Uh, nothing personal is his daily podcast. And as you can tell from the last 15 minutes, he is worth a daily listen. You can follow David on Twitter at David, the letter P Sampson, David P Sampson. Once again, CBS Sports HQ and the podcast, Nothing Personal. David, uh, thanks for getting up for us. If you did uh, try to get more sleep next time. I look forward to the next time. See you guys soon. David Sampson, kind enough to join us once again.